Last week we did the first part of this lesson, and we noted that the idea of having a life coach is something new in our culture, and that there are a number of people that are spending good money to have someone coach them through life and give them advice about various things. Before that, we heard a lot about people mentoring, still do, mentoring another individual. The neat thing about a life coach or a mentor is those are biblical principles. They're not called that in the Bible. We will find passages like Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 15, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. Also, verse 12, Strengthen the hands that are feeble and the knees that are feeble. I like that, that verse. It tells us that every Christian has an obligation to help coach each other or encourage one another. Uh, we're supposed to be aware of who's not keeping up on this path we're on. Uh, who's getting a little off track? Who looks really, really tired? Who needs some encouragement? Other passages that we could note on the, on along the same line would be a passage like 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And in that verse, verse 14 says, We urge you, brethren, admonish generally, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be, be patient with all men. And so those are passages that tell us that every Christian has somewhat of an obligation to help mentor, encourage, coach, admonish, other members. And then we could add to that, we could add the role of elders or pastors or bishops. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 2, shepherd the flock of God among them. That word shepherd means ten. Feed, oversee, protect, guide, lead. And the ultimate though, the ultimate life coach. We could also talk about parents. Parents are also life coaches. But the ultimate life coach, the ultimate mentor, the, op the ultimate master teacher is Christ. We even find that in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 4, when the chief shepherd appears. In this second part of this series, and final part of the series, we want to ask ourselves, and if, if, we, if we made an appointment with Jesus this week and went to his office and gave him our life, what would he tell us? What are some things that Jesus would tell us as a life coach or shepherd or master teacher? And I want to start with Matthew chapter 5 and verse 37. Here's one of the things that Jesus may tell you in your session. But let your statement be, yes, yes, or no, no, anything beyond these is evil. This passage never was meant to say that yes and no were the only words you could ever use in talking to someone. The original context of the passage deals with promises, vows, particularly promises to God, but I think there's an application also to promises to people. Some of the Jewish people had fallen into the real bad habit or sin of making a promise, but then intentionally giving themselves a loophole or an out so they didn't have to keep the promise. They would promise something based on the temple, but they would say, well, I didn't swear by the gold on the temple. They had a lot of fine lines and splitting hairs and distinctions in what made a promise binding and what did not make and what made a promise not binding. And God says, I hate that sort of acting and, and hypocrisy. You make a promise, keep the promise. You don't want to do something, then say no. You want to do something, say yes. But be careful with, be careful with making promises that you don't intend to keep. Because, and the temptation is, and I know the temptation, the temptation is to tell people, I'll be there, I'll be there, oh yeah, I'll be there. Because you want to be viewed as responsible. You want to be viewed as giving and sacrificing and, and yet you're involved. You want to be viewed that way. But sometimes you'll tell people, I'll be there, I'll be, I'll, I'll be, I'll, I'll be there. 
And you, we don't intend to be there. And we say, well, if I don't make it there, I'll just tell them something came up. And that's a violation of this passage. When you already know, you're not going to do that. If you're going to be there, then be there. Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. And then we walk a little farther here. As don't make commitments that you don't intend to keep. Don't get yourself also into the habit of trying to justify yourself. And what I mean by that, and I think there's an application of this verse. One other said, the shorter the tail, the less likely you're to get caught in a trap. The idea is that when you say a lot, when you kind of keep on telling people why you did something, the further you're probably getting away from repentance. Another application is that sometimes we, well, we try to please everyone with a statement. I think that's something that sometimes frustrates, frustrates people about candidates, political candidates. You can tell that a particular statement was, that it was, a, it was crafted to try to appeal to the broadest number of people, which may mean nothing. We, we've, we've stretched this position to the point that it means nothing. As a Christian, as a Christian, there's a freedom of understanding. I'm not going to make everyone happy. And God said, that's okay. You have permission not to please everyone. You have permission that, to say something that not everyone's going to like. I like Luke chapter 6. In Luke chapter 6, and here's a, here's a section here about various woes and things like that. In verse 26, woe to you when all men speak well of you. And I think that's, that's a verse that young preachers are always shown. Don't try to please everyone. Speak the truth. You've got the freedom to speak the truth and not everyone's going to like it. A lot of times when you try to appeal to everyone or craft it in such a way that no one would be offended by it, all the important stuff in it, what you're really trying to say gets lost. In Proverbs chapter 10, verse 19, when there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. I try to keep that in mind when I write an article on a topic or when I'm dealing with a subject. You know, it's like, if I have to go on and on and on about something, maybe I don't understand this topic the way I thought. That's something that sometimes I try to deal with young preachers is, I want you to take a topic and I, want, I just want one or maybe an issue Give me one page. Let's see if we can boil that down to one page. That may indicate whether you really understand that topic or not. Let's go a little farther here. The benefits of the yes, yes, no, no. First of all, it helps us repent, as I said. The longer we attempt to explain ourselves, the less likely we're seeing our sin. And I think our kids need to learn that. I mean, it, it, the longer you're taking of explaining to your mom and dad why you did something or why you did not do something, and it starts going on and on, the farther you're getting away from repentance. If you can sum it up and say, I didn't clean my room because I want to do something else, and that was wrong. That's good. That's a good way. But to go on and on and on and on and on and on, well, we're, we're not... We're not we're, we're getting kind of away from owning up. In fact, we're getting to the point that it almost sounds like God owes us an apology for even calling us on something. Also, it shortens the time that we spend in profitless and frustrating situations. Have you ever agreed to do something that you really didn't want to do, but you did? And, and it's not a moral, it was not a moral issue. It's not somewhere you need to be. But you agreed to do something, and you didn't want to be there, and there was nothing divine, there was nothing that God, ex God did not expect you to be there, and it's not some, uh, some requirement you were supposed to be there, and, and what you need to learn is, if you don't want to do something, tell people. I've told Cindy, she's talked about skydiving, I've done a lot of things with her, but I've said, I'm not skydiving, no, 
No, it's not a maybe, it's not a maybe, it's not a we'll see, it is flat out no. And to me, that liberates me. I don't, I don't ever have to, the topic never has to come up again on that. And there's a lot of things in life like that. If, 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 if nothing demands you do that, and God says, no, that's just an opinion area, you don't have to do that, and if you don't really want to do it, then tell people that. And it gets us out of unhealthy and energy draining situations. I want to specifically look like da at Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16. Now, there's nothing wrong with telling people a maybe. Uh, we, we don't want to get to the point where we say like a maybe is wrong. There's nothing wrong with telling people maybe because sometimes, sometimes basically you have to tell people, you know, I don't know, I have, my schedule's not really completed this week. And so right now, and I think when you say right now it's a maybe. Right now, it's a we'll see, because I don't know, right now, I, certain things, I don't know if they're going to give me the time to get there. And so, yeah, there, there are times that a we'll see and a maybe is appropriate. But there are other times, particularly when you're dealing with temptation, that a maybe is really, really dangerous. And I think of Daniel's three friends. Because Nebuchadnezzar gives Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego basically another chance to fall down and worship his image. Nebuchadnezzar was told, there's three guys out here and they're not fall, falling down and worshiping your image when all this music is played. And so they're brought to Nebuchadnezzar and he says, is it true? And in verse 15 he says of Daniel 3, now if you're ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the psaltery, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I made very well, but if you do not worship, you will be immediately cast into the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Now, what Nebuchadnezzar is doing there is he's giving them a second chance. They've already violated his command. And it looks like that they are important to Nebuchadnezzar. Like, I don't, I don't want to, I mean, these guys are very useful to me. I just don't want to throw them into the fire now. And so what we're going to do is we're going to give them a second chance. We're going to give them a chance to, like, well, would you really like to think about that? You know, we got this burning fire over here. Now, with, when all this music plays, if you'll just kind of fall down at the image, you know, we'll forget all about this stuff, that you have not doing it. And I think a lot of times that's the way Satan operates with us. Uh, now, Mark... Wouldn't you rather sleep on that? Wouldn't you rather kind of think about that? You know, you don't have to give me a decision now. You know, it's interesting, Satan. Satan doesn't necessarily want you making a commitment now. He just wants you to kind of sleep on it. Give it some thought. And I love what Daniel's three friends do. They say in verse 16, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. The answer is not maybe, or we'll think about it, or we'll sleep on it, or, huh, interesting point you're making here. It's no. And I think this is a great application of what Jesus was saying, let your yes be yes and your no be no. When you know something is wrong, you need to tell the person right there at that point, no. And oh. Let your yes be yes and your no be no. And because if a man, the longer... Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the longer they delay in saying, no, we're not going to fall down, they're only giving Satan. I mean, anytime, anytime you sleep on a temptation or you don't make a definite commitment to God, all you're doing is, how many of you guys have done this? I know some of you guys have done this for fun. Others have said, we're never doing that again, the timeshare thing. And I'm, nothing wrong with timeshare. But it's the, you can come here, a weekend, a free room. All you got to do is sit down to a two-hour, an hour presentation, and you get this free room. And I know some of you have done that. And, and, and they're calling you all the time. And, 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 and that's what Satan, basically, when you say maybe to a temptation, what you're allowing Satan to do is you're now locked into Satan's timeshare. And until you say no, he's going to be knocking on the door and calling you. Have you thought about that? Just think, you know, are you liking your stay here? Have you made a decision yet? And he's not going to let up on you until you say no. 
Your yes be yes and your no be no. And it gets you out of a lot of unhealthy situations. Deal immediately with temptation. May I suggest to you also, if there's, any, if there's a person you need to talk to, if there's something you need to deal with, deal immediately with that because that's going to keep you up asleep at night. That's going to take all the energy out of your life and your motivation. And deal with things proactively and immediately and stay on top of things and don't procrastinate. A lot of times, maybes, maybes make us miserable. I wanted to say no. I should have told them no, but I said maybe, and now they're going to come back to me. And but you're, it, it can, it, What Jesus is trying to tell you is that just telling the truth can liberate you. Let's go a little farther here. It also, a definite yes and a definite no can keep us from reasoning ourselves right out of a passage. And I want to get you an example here. I was talking to Barry Kirchville recently, and he said, oh, he's, we were talking about some things and talking about some issues that were coming up in the uh, kind of the whole marriage, divorce, or marriage thing. And he said, he said like, Mark, now listen to this. He says, me, him and Brett, his son, were listening to this tape, and here's what the preacher said on 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 11. Here's what the verse says, but if she does leave, that is if a woman leaves her husband, if she does leave, let her remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. That's what the text says. Here's what the preacher said about the text in this tape. There's only two options in the verse, be reconciled or remain unmarried. But if she cannot reconcile, then she is unmarried. And if she's unmarried, she can marry someone else. Now, you just reason yourself right out of the verse. And, and, and that's a great example of how that can be done. That's not what that verse says at all. And you, there, there you went. And I think the importance of that, your, your yes be yes and your no be no is a lot of times it keeps you in the Scripture. And it keeps you just... Well, that verse didn't even need to be read if we reach that conclusion. Let's go a little farther. Let's make another application from another verse. Let's go over Luke chapter 12. Luke 12 and verse 18. Earlier in the text, Jesus had said, here's a story. Land of a certain rich man was very productive. He began reasoning to himself, saying, What shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, This is what I will do. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there will I store all my grain and my goods. You know what? Maybe our land never produced like that, but I think a lot of us have daydreamed that scenario. What if? What if I came into... What if a windfall came into my life? What if an all of a sudden, this unexpected abundance came into my life. Have you ever kind of daydreamed about what you would do, three-car garage or four-car garage? And, and would it be a split level or one-story or two-story? Would you live in the city or the country, a nice condo downtown Portland? You know, are you going to be at the beach or the mountains? You know, the beach or Ben? You know, have you ever kind of gone through, okay, now what, what would I need to... And, and you're kind of going through the, this whole scenario of what you would do. And, of course, God would give some. Doesn't that always come up? And, of course, I would give some to God. Because that's almost permission to keep on daydreaming. <laughs> you know, yeah, of course, I'd be generous with my contribution, and I would do this. Now, back to the things I would buy. Um, and I think we've, we've all done that sort of thing. Well, this man and I actually comes into his life. It comes true. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods. Let it for many years come. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? And I like the idea that what one other said, God wants you to big, build a bigger life and not just bigger barns. And I think sometimes a lot of our daydreams are about bigger barns instead of the bigger life we could have. Sometimes the bigger barn is unrealistic. That's never going to happen. But the bigger life is always realistic. Uh, there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with daydreaming. I think it's more of what you're daydreaming about. Do you ever daydream about not necessarily bigger barns, but having a bigger life? You know, that is, do you ever daydream about 
I would like to have more friends, and I would like to be maybe a more outgoing, friendlier person. And I would like, you know, I need to, I need to start talking. You know, I bet, I bet I could at least talk to one person a day about God. Do you ever dream about that your life being bigger like that, that you're, you're that person who's sharing the gospel pretty frequently with individuals? That you're bringing a number of people to services, or you've got classes set up with people that, yeah, I, I think I could be that person. And, I got, and, I'm the, and I'm the person in the neighborhood that likes, knows everybody, and neighbors and people move in, I, I welcome them into the neighborhood, and you know what? I know more about people than just their name and which car they drive on the street. I know who they are. I know how many kids they have. I know what to do for work. I know what's going on in my life. I talk to them across the fence and, and all sorts of things. And you can make some other applications here. But do you ever daydream about your big life? Because you know what? For every one of us, that's doable. Every one of us can have this big life. I want to talk a little bit about your retirement account. I want to go to Mark chapter 10. And again, why is to prepare for retirement? A lot of people are not ready for retirement. And many of us may just may need to continue to work as long as we can with the cost of living and things like that. And a number of us, hey, I'm, I'm planning on doing that, you know. I may, I may want to travel a little bit more or whatever, but I'm always going to be doing something. But I want you to think about a different type of account. Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, verse 29, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters, father, mother, or children, or farms, for my sake and for the gospel's sake. But he shall receive a hundred times as much now in the present age Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, farms, along with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. Do you ever think about that retirement account? And 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17 to me is another one. A great passage. Instruct those who are rich in this present world, and many people outside of this country, and even within this country, would consider many of us here this morning well off. You ever, think about, you ever think about the person that comes and sees, sees you maybe from India, somewhere in Asia, South America, whatever, maybe in Africa, and all you do is show them what's in your garage? I, I, think, I think they would say, wow. Just look at the stuff in my garage. I think, I think sometimes we don't consider ourselves. We measure ourselves with someone way up the ladder and that I'm just struggling and, you know, whatever, but I've also got a lot of comforts and nice things. Instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly su supplies us with all th good things to enjoy. Instruct them to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. In the handout, and I, I really am love reading this uh, reading this story I read across. The man, the man wrote a book, and he said he, he, had a, he went to a party in New York City, and he visited with a woman, and what this woman does for a living is she coordinates top-level meetings with very wealthy people. That's what she does. She, she puts together meetings or little mini-conventions for very successful, very wealthy people. And she, and she noted that typically what these meetings have, that the meetings all kind of have the same theme, that is, the speakers, the selection of speakers, basically are dealing with things as far as what, you, what these people want to control. They want to control their health. They want to control the economy. They want to control politics. And, and, and the lady who puts this together says she sometimes wants to stand up and scream to these people, these are all things you really can't control, totally. Now, again, you can, you can, take, you can exercise and eat well and things like that, and you can think, well, I'm in control there. 
And, and, you can, and you can give to certain political campaigns, and that's great, and be involved, and think that you're, we're making a difference there. But sometimes what we need to realize is there's a number of things that we really don't have absolute control over. Only God has control. And, and I, I really like the statement that, uh, don't be shocked. The statement on the handout was, it reminds me of a joke circulating on, on the internet about the number of very upset, health-conscious people who eventually have to face the fact that they died of nothing. Did cancer get me? No. Did a heart attack get me? No. Uh -uh. No. no. Did, well, was it a bad, uh, was it a, a malfunctioning airbag? No, it wasn't that either. Was it, uh, I had the brakes done in my car. No, it wasn't the brakes done in your car either. Or, uh, uh, well, I, you know, when I heard that scare about this, I stopped eating that. No, no it wasn't that either. What, what did I die of? Nothing. You just died. <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, no one's going to live forever. You just died. You just kind of peacefully die. Now, that there, obviously, there might be some, you know, medical and could put together, here's actually what kind of happened in your body at that moment. But I really like that observation of, I am going to die. And ultimately, I don't have control over that. And where I need to put the emphasis is in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 18. While I have life, I want to make sure I'm rich in good works. That's one thing I can control. I can control my service to God. That's prob I know one of the things that right now unnerves a lot of people about the upcoming election season is that it looks like everything is completely up for grabs with the presidential rates. It, I think a lot of people are nervous that it looks like everything's out of, you know, that there's no, it looks dead heat, tied, neck and neck. Those are exciting times. But those are also certain things that you can't absolutely control. I'm reminded of Daniel. Daniel, God rules in the kingdoms of men and the gives them to whomever he wishes. There's always that factor, the God factor. Let's go a little farther here. Living in the future doesn't mean kind of always be wishing you were somewhere else. Doesn't mean wishing your life away. Doesn't mean I wish I was in college now, I wish I was married now. Living in future basically, and I like the idea of every day you wake up, ask yourself, is today the day I die? Me and, me and Zach, oh, me and Matt and Zach and Josh were coming home last night, and there was an accident there at the Lake Oswego exit. And, and you know, you have an, often you have an exit and you kind of have some barriers coming out. And you've ever wondered, like, what would happen to me if I ran into that barrier? Well, a car did. Car ran into it and flipped, truck did. Four wheel drive truck did and flipped and it was on its side. And it looked like, it looked like, that's bad. And I don't know what caused that. May have been no driver fault at all. But is today the day? Is today my last day on this earth? That, I think that's what it means to live in the future. Am I doing all I need to do? What if I died today? Am I being the person I want to be? That if, if Jesus said, Mark, now is your time, am I what I want to be? Am I where I want to be spiritually at this age in my life? Do I feel about where I am in my relationship with God? Have I learned how to die? And am I able to impart that lesson to others? We talked about that a little bit this morning in the Bible class, but ho hopefully all of us as Christians, that when we are dying, if we know in advance we're going to die, if we kind of have the slow death instead of the, I didn't know it was coming. At least we can kind of help teach people, here's how you do it. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 26, to me, living in the future includes, like Moses' attitude, he was looking to the reward. Or Colossians 3, verse 1. Set your mind on things above. That's what I mean by living in the future. Live every day fully aware of the fact this may be your last day. And I hope, here's a, I hope you try to do that with others. That is, 
In your marriage, I think it makes a big difference in your marriage being aware that today may be the last day with your spouse. I think that makes a big difference in the relationship you have with your parents. If you realize today may be the last day I have with my parents. I think you treat your parents differently. I think you treat your kids differently. I think we treat our brethren differently. I think we treat our mates differently. And I think we live differently if we realize today may be the last day for them or us. And I think as we go to the next thing, one job of a leader, and in every family we have a leader, the husband, in congregations we have leaders, and nations we have leaders, but one job of a leader is to change people's perspective. And is there anything presently in, in the way of me going to heaven right now? If I die right now, is there any problems? You know, I don't want to end up at the judgment day and God said we've got a problem. Are there any hindrances? Anything right now in the way of me making it to heaven? Remember God's promises. I think a leader, leaders remind you of God's promises. Parents remind you of God's promises. God loves you. Jesus died for you. Uh, you, you don't have to yield to temptation. You can make it through temptation. Uh, you can understand the scriptures. God wants you saved. You can repent. You can change. Those are God's promises. Help others see what is really important. I th to me, Jesus did this. I want to look at a couple passages here. First, I want to look at Matthew chapter 12. I think, I think Jesus was... Of course, he's God. He's, he's the best. He's the best at helping people with their perspective. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 46, someone comes up while Jesus is still speaking and said, your mother, your brothers are standing outside. They want to talk to you. That's verse 47. Here's what he said. Who is my mother and who are my brothers? Stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Behold, my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father who is in heaven, he is my brother, sister, and mother. And there's a couple other places where I see Jesus did something like that. In Luke chapter 10 and verse 17, here's where the disciples come back. So excited about their miraculous powers. The seven return with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And I don't find it boasting. They said, in your name. I don't, I don't think they're saying, look at what we can do. We're awesome. I don't think that was the attitude. I think they're just excited. Look at what we're able to do for you. Look at what we're able to do for God. Because we did it in your name, not our name. We're relying upon your power. And in verse 18 and 19, Jesus Agrees with that. He said, yeah, I, I saw Satan falling from heaven like lightning. And I've given you power to tread on scorpions and serpents and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall injure you. But then he said, in verse, he, then there's one of these neverthelesses in verse 20. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. I love that passage. But because it's like going to heaven is even more important than to be able to work a miracle. That's the true benefit. That's the true blessing. The other one I think about is kind of the same sort of context there. And I'm not going to deal with it right at this time. All right. Put a time limit on. I think Jesus would advise us there are certain things that we should, yeah, maybe a minute a day or less. 30 seconds. Put a time limit on worry. If you're going to worry, then say, I'm only going to worry for a minute this morning. That's it for the rest of the day. I like that. Anger. Put a time limit on anger. I'll be angry for, okay, I'll be angry for 30 seconds and that's it. You know, I think, that, I think that's a great thing for parents that parents can do with your kids. Okay, you've got 30 seconds. Go in here, you've got 30 seconds. 30 seconds to be angry. 30 seconds to feel sorry for yourself, and then we're going. I mean, if you develop that habit when you're young, you know, mom and dad only let me be sorry for myself for 30 seconds a day. I mean, you know, so that's a, I never can get in the habit because I was only allowed to be sorry for myself for 30 seconds. And, and you can't really work up a good feeling sorry for yourself 
in 30 seconds. Are you that ter- type of person that you're all, oh, my needs are not being met, my needs are not being met. What about me? Uh, how about this one? What's wrong with? What's wrong with? What's wrong with my mate? What's wrong with my kids? What's wrong with my parents? What's wrong with the church? It's easy to get to, to slide into the what wrong with? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with my job? What's wrong with the people I work with? What's wrong with the government? I think you need to put a time limit on that. For all the imperfections of human government, when I need hot, when I need hot water and, and clean hot water, I got it. When I need cold, clean water, I got it. When I need electricity, boink, I got it. When I need to go somewhere and get on the road, pretty much, there it is. For all government's imperfections, in my opinion, things seem to run pretty sweet and smooth for a lot of the time. Put a time limit, and the same thing is with the church. Don't focus on what's wrong with this or that. See all of the great things that are going on among God's people. And then you focus on your broken dreams and promises and never got to do. I was in line with a lady the other day at Winco and she was asking me which candidate I was going to vote for. And, and, and I told them, oh, I like this one over here. And she kind of said, well, I like that one too. She's killed a moose. And then, and then, and then the, lady, the lady went into the fact that she'd never, ever killed an elk in her life. And she looked about, she looked later 40s, maybe 50, right in there. And I said, well, why don't you go out and do it? I mean, you're not, you're not dead yet. Go out and get your elk. And, and if that's the habit you're in of things that haven't come true in your life, promises unfulfilled, things you never got to do, well, do it. Go out and do it. Fearful thoughts. Feeling sorry for yourself. Time limit. Time limit on all those things. I like the idea that chip on the shoulder, if you've been walking around life with a chip on the shoulder, a chip on the shoulder is a wound that's not healed. It's a wound that's scarred over. That's what a chip on the shoulder is. And I think that's a very accurate way of describing it. A wound that has become hardened rather than healed. I think what God wants to happen, God wants the various wounds that you receive in life to make you more sensitive, to make you more compassionate upon other people. That's what God wants the wounds to do. That's what we have in Christ. We're told that Christ can sympathize with us because he he went through everything we went through. That is, his wounds and scars did not make Christ hardened. Like, I'm never dealing with those people again. They crucified me. Rather, come to me. All you're weary and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. I'll take care of you. Let the wounds that you receive in life make you sensitive, not calloused. Because the Bible says, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, get rid of all the bitterness. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, putting aside all malice. I had a, had a I told Cindy I had a frustrating dream the other night. The street in front of our house was getting paved. So all our cars had to be off the street. And all these signs went up that says, if your car's not off the street, it's going to get towed. The night before they were going to pave, I had this dream about my truck getting towed. Okay, I got the, my, the yellow truck got towed in the dream. And the Cindy's saying, you know, but what the thing's worth and the cost of getting it out of impound, you mind should just leave it. You know, just let her go. That's what Cindy said in the dream. You know, it's not worth 300 bucks. The frustrating thing about being the dream is that I felt helpless in the dream, that I didn't do something out of character in the dream. I wished I, wished I could in the dream at least blown up a couple of tow trucks or shot some people or whatever and got some relief. You know, got some relief. 
Because I felt just as frustrated in the dream as I would feel in real life. Well, it told my car, and I can't, oh, I, I, got, I got to pay the 200, 300 bucks, all the little nickel and dime fines to get it back, and there's nothing I could do. And they could say, that's right, there's nothing you can do, buddy, you're helpless. Putting aside all mounts, all desire to injure, get rid of all that. I've got to work on that too. There are times that malice creeps in. It'd sure be nice to make that person pay in some way. That'd be legal. Malice. Get rid of pent-up hostility, even if it feels good at times. That is, uh, it, it, bitterness feels good. Feels good to hang on to. But it's not good for you. Ask yourself, and as we close the lesson, this is one advice I would give like the various political candidates before they go into debate. Before you go into a debate, ask yourself the hard questions first and come up with a solution. You know, no, no one needs to hear any more criticism. No one, one anyway, this isn't right, this isn't right, whatever. What are you going to do? I want to hear what you're going to do. I want to hear the answer and I want to hear the solution. And I think there's a great benefit of that. And 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says, examine yourselves, test yourselves, see if you're in the faith. Ask yourself the hard questions first. I think as a Christian, the benefit of that is it keeps you from getting frustrated. Because I already looked at that problem, I already looked at that issue, and I thought about it, and instead of complaining about something, I worked up a solution. Here's the answer to that. Here's what you do. That's practical and positive. The benefits of that is I think you'll find tremendous personal growth and Bible knowledge. Moving forward instead of being stuck. If you're frustrated sometimes about people falling away, what's the answer? If, if you're wondering about a particular passage, how do you implement that? What's the answer? If you're thinking about a, a, some sort of scenario that is very difficult, what do you think the solution is? And I think that enables you to get ahead instead of just staying somewhere stuck. Knowing that, but you feel a lot better and more confident with answers and solutions in your pocket. Because you didn't spend your time complaining you spent your time working on the problem, figuring out a way to solve it. I like that. And you know you got the answer. Or you know at least you got one answer. And if you work the plan, good things can happen. And people are going to come to you because you're the person who has practical answers. And you have a lot more confidence in Scripture. That God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And people will appreciate your help. Because you come with a solution. And I think that's very important. Even, even, when, even when you have to rebuke somebody or offer some constructive criticism, I think it's so important that part of the package deal that comes with your constructive criticism is what you offer with your constructive criticism is a not only a solution, but I'll help you. I'll help you, and I think here's the path. And I'll work together with you on that. I think people appreciate that sort of help. We're going to stop here. There may be one here this morning who's not a Christian. Jesus is not your master right now. He's not your shepherd. When Jesus was not my shepherd, I was getting really bad advice from whatever mentors I was following, whatever life coaches I had were just, their lives weren't any good and my life wasn't turning out much differently. What, what better teacher than God to help you how to live? To become a Christian, the Bible says to believe that Jesus is the Christ, to turn from your sins, repent, to confess your faith in Christ, be baptized, immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins. 1 Peter 3.21, baptism now saves you. Whatever need you have, it comes to stand and sing together.